Hello and good evening, friends. Today is the first talk in the resident series of the ACNS webinars for the month of September. And it is our great honor to have with us today the past president of the Jordanian Neuroscience Society, who was also the past president of the Pan Arab Neurosurgical Society, Professor Ibrahim Sibay from Jordan. Professor Sibay was the second vice president at large of the WFNS and is currently a member of the several committees of the WFNS, namely the Skull Bay Surgery Committee, the Education Committee of the WFNS, the Fundraising Committee, and the International Initiative Committee. Professor Sebe currently works at the Department of Neurosurgery at the Farah Hospital Campus, Jordan. He is a reputed speaker and educator who is committed to the education of the young neurosurgeons around the world. His online lectures available on YouTube, which is titled The Jordan Neurosurgery Grand Rounds, are a priceless source of education for the young neurosurgery residents and young neurosurgeons around the world. He is a renowned researcher and he has written quite a few number of articles among which is one of my all-time favorites, which he wrote in 2009 in Surgical Neurology, which is titled, Do We Need a Neurosurgical Interpol? Today, Professor Sebe is going to talk about phenocavernous meningioma. To chair this session of Professor Sebe, we, we have an eminent neurosurgeon who is the director of neurosurgery, Shimane Prefectural Central Hospital, Izumo, Japan. Professor Fusao Ikawa. Professor Ikawa is a prominent member of the Japanese Neurosurgical Society as well as the WFNS. He is a renowned skull based surgeon and also a vascular surgeon. He is the author of several books and scientific papers. On behalf of the Education Committee of the ACNS and the President Professor Yoko Kato, I welcome the speaker Professor Ibrahim Sebe and the Chair Professor Fusao Ikawa to this online platform of ACNS webinars. Dr. Liu Bun Seng from Malaysia is my co host for today. And with that introduction, may I please hand over the proceeding to the chair, Professor Fusao Ikawa. I am Fusao Ikawa from uh, Shimane, Japan. I'm a member of ACNS. Today, Professor Ibrahim uh, from Jordan. Uh, he is a famous uh, skull based surgeon, and uh, he came to Japan many times. And he has many Japanese friends. And today, he will present Spain of Cabanas. Manijoma, he experienced many cases of uh, this region. And he can present pitfall and uh, his experience about this region. Thank you. Uh, lecture. Right. Uh, so I would say good afternoon or good evening, depending on where you are. My name is Ibrahim Sveh. I am from Jordan. And uh, today we are going to discuss the clinoidal meningioma, so-called also sphenocavernous meningioma. And I always like to discuss these uh, topics uh, from many aspects, the clinical aspect, the radiological aspect, the operative aspect, the pathological aspect, and try to correlate all these together. Before I start, I'd like to take the first five minutes to introduce my country and myself. Uh, I've been a member of the Asian CNS uh, for so many years, and here I'm with so many uh, uh, dear friends and colleagues. And uh, I became member of the many committees of the World Federation, uh, Skull Base Committee. I've been a member since 1999, so it's almost 21 years. Again, you can see that uh, most of the people uh, you know very well. And also a member of the Education Committee of the World Federation. Uh, and the, the most active one from the chair people of the uh, Education Committee was Professor Yoko Kata. And we really traveled the world from north to south, east to west, and we visited countries like Argentina uh, to Vietnam to Kazakhstan and so on and so forth. So here we are in Thailand. and. Uh, picture here in, in, uh, in Russia and so on. I became the uh, vice president of the World Federation uh, for the region of the Middle East. Uh, here we are in the committee of the World Federation. Professor Takeshi Kawashi is here. Professor Ling, Asant Meshwara, Yuko Kato and so on. Here we are in Geneva, uh, an unusual meeting that we had every year. And I became a member of the uh, World Academy of Neurosurgery, ERWAR in Vienna in 2014. Again, uh, you can see lots of Asian neurosurgeons as member of this prestigious committee. 
I am on the editorial or advisory board of seven journals, including Board of Neurosurgery, Surgical Neurology, Neurosurgery, the Pan-Arab Asian Journal of Neurosurgery, and many others. Uh, this is Jordan. Uh, we are in the Middle East. This is Africa. Uh, this is the Arabian Peninsula. Here is Turkey. Here we have Iran. Here we have Afghanistan and Pakistan. So you can see we are in the middle of the uh, Middle East. This is the Mediterranean Sea. This is the Black Sea. This is the Red Sea. And this is the Indian Ocean. So this is uh, concentrating on Jordan. We are bordered by Syria, Saudi Arabia, uh, Egypt, Israel, and the Palestinian Authority. And we have two seas in Jordan, the Dead Sea and the Red Sea. So here we are. Dead Sea and the Red Sea. Uh, this is the Dead Sea. You are at the lowest point on Earth, 420 meters below sea level. So you have the highest barometric pressure. And this area is for treatment of so many diseases, including Parkinson's disease, including uh, psoriasis, including skin diseases, so many. It's a really curative area. And it is called the sea because there is no marine life. Is high salt content that no marine life can live. But for that reason also, if you just put yourself on the surface of the water, you would float and you can read your, uh, read your newspaper without any difficulty. So it's very difficult to get drowned in the Dead Sea. As you can see, this is very high salt content, very nice evening and very nice touristic sites there very, very civilized area uh, for tourism and lots of uh, conference halls and meetings that can be held there and also the well-being of a human being that we really take care of. And this is the very famous mud mask, which everybody coming to the, uh, to the Dead Sea wanted. You can have a, a body ma mask or face mask. It's very curative for so, so many skin diseases. And it is recognized as a site for treatment of Parkinson patients. Many Parkinson patients came to Jordan, went to the Dead Sea and they were cured. Uh, if we go from there to the baptism site at the River Jordan, Jordan is a country with religion intolerance. With religion tolerance. Uh, Jews, Christians and Muslims lived there for so many years. This is the Holy Land and we respect the other religions. In fact, 18% of the Jordan populations are Christian. So uh, Christianity in Jordan is well established and respect that, we respect Judaism too. This is the baptism site at the River Jordan. You can see there. And this is where the baptism takes place. Lots of tourists coming for this reason, uh, whether a kid or an adult is baptized and this is the Pope visiting us a couple of years ago. And uh, he stopped there looking at the Holy Land where Judaism and Christianity and uh, Islam uh, uh, live together. And these are some of the very ancient uh, mosaic maps in Jordan going back to the 6th century. This is Jarash, which is only second to Rome. This is the best Roman city preserved after Rome. It's really big, huge thing. And just walking there, you can smell history, you can feel history. And in, in Janash, there is a very famous festival every year where people come from all over the world with all kinds of musical uh, uh, presentations. So all kinds of uh, festivality comes there every year in Jordan, where actually hundreds of thousands of tourism coming there. If you go to the capital of Man and you go to the old city, you can see and also smell the history. This is the uh, Roman amphitheater, which can house 10,000 people and lots of concerts and musical concerts are played there. Uh, then going out from Amman towards Petra, you will pass by Wadi Rum, where so many, it's called moonscape-like, because you feel like on the moon. And so many movies have been played in that area. Uh, 
This is Wadi Rum, a touristic site, famous touristic site. And you may not believe this, but this is the railway that was established 120 years ago, which comes from Turkey, go to the uh, to Mecca and uh, in the Islamic parts, passing through Jordan. It's still functioning, but with uh, new machines. Uh, Petra is the jewel of the crown. It is one of the seven wonders of the world. This is Petra at daytime, this is at nighttime. This is the slip that takes you to Petra. It's a hidden city. It is called Rose City. It's very famous for all tourism, for all tourists. Uh, going back to the, down to the uh, other sea, which is the Aqaba on the uh, Red Sea, uh, where you can have all kinds of sports, snorkeling. And this is my daughter, actually. Uh, she's a snorkeling lover. And uh, here she is. There is a tank that has been actually sank into the bottom in addition to some ships so that marine life would, would accumulate. Uh, eco conservation in Jordan is very, very important. We love to conserve eco and uh, we have lots of touristic sites and lots of greeneries and, and so on and so forth. People think of Jordan as a desert. Part of it is a desert, but part of it is greenery and mountains. So here are some of the pictures and this is a deer. Uh, of the conservation, conservatory, and this is the famous black iris, which is the symbol of Jordan. Beautiful uh, scenery, especially in springtime. And believe it or not, we have snow every year in Jordan. This is my house, this is my wife, and you can see the amount of snow that we have every year. Lots of people don't believe that. Uh, Jordan has been famous for its, it's, it's a medical hub for the Middle East and the first hospital in Jordan that was in 1926, it's called Italian Hospital, it's still standing there, uh, but lots of new government hospitals. Famous King Hussein uh, uh, Medical Center and Cancer Center, uh, the pediatric hospitals, the University of Jordan, and lots and lots of private hospitals, which uh, they are cooperating with the public uh, sector. And we have private hospital. This is the hospital where I work in, the Farah Hospital, the very famous and very new modernized uh, hospital. And this is the lecture hall where I give my weekly presentation. The first uh, neurosurgeon in Jordan was Dr. Antoine Tarzi back in 1963. He trained in Montreal in Canada, and when he came back, he worked in Jerusalem. Here he's in Augusta Victoria Hospital. Augusta Victoria is a very famous hospital that was built by Wilhelm, the, uh, the, the, uh, the man who was governing uh, Germany, and he built it to be a palace to take the Christian tour, the Christian pilgrims down to, uh, to Jerusalem. Here he is using the Hudson Brace. Uh, so he used to cover both uh, Palestine and Jordan. And uh, the first CT scan, again, many people may not believe this, but the first CT scan in Jordan was 1978. Jordan was country number eight to acquire a CT scan. Uh, CT scan was invented at the Atkinson Morley Hospital in London in 76, and we were the first country in the Middle East and one of the first countries in the world to acquire the CT scan. So neurosurgical uh, uh, insight was built in. Many famous visitors came to Jordan to actually see the, this uh, new machine. Uh, the first heart transplant was done in Jordan back in 1985. First open heart surgery was done in 1973. And this is uh, General David Hanania, who uh, uh, was the famous man for the director of this hospital. Uh, other uh, land, um, milestone is the first IVF baby back in 86, and this is Dr. Lee, Dr. Zaid Kilani. He was not only the, 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 the man who started the IVF, but he also is known as an inventor. Uh, this is the first Arab and European meeting back in 1979 in Jordan. So many conferences were held in Jordan uh, all over the years. 83 uh, asked the uh, establishment of the Jordanian in Neuroscience Society. We started with the 23 members. Now we are over, we split actually the neurologist and the neurosurgeon 
the Neurosurgical Society now is 63 members. Uh, as I said, we, we uh, applied to host the World Federation uh, Congress back in 2000, for the year 2013, back in 2007. The voting occurred in Nagoya, Japan. I was there, and this is the uh, book that we uh, prepared. Uh, we established a very nice modern cadaveric lab in Jordan for so many years, and uh, this is a very modern, spacious, very nice cadaveric lab made of eight stations, and this is my daughter uh, training there. We had uh, famous names like Professor Rinko Dolins, Ali Kresh, visiting us for so many courses that we built, because we believe that we should be the medical hub also for medical education. Uh, this is uh, Professor Firas from Austria came to uh, for a course on uh, anastomosis, vascular anastomosis. And the many, uh, I'm really proud that we served so many people, so many residents from all over the country, from Africa, from the Arabian, from Asia, and so on. Uh, we also worked on empowering the Arab women in neurosurgery, because the leaders in this uh, women in neurosurgery Gerda So and Professor Link from China, from China. and uh, here are the many neurosurgical residents that I train, including my, my daughter. I believe strongly in empowering women in neurosurgery. We acquired the first gamma knife back in 96. Uh, we have all sorts of uh, PET scan, interventional uh, biological treatment, uh, navigation, and kind of nerves monitoring. And this is me visiting uh, Tokyo Women Medical University back in 1995. Uh, I remember the ICU there, and they were recording the brain temperature, uh, which was very unique. Uh, we also met with the, the, the emperor and his wife, and we had so many meetings because it was an official uh, uh, delegation in that area. Here we are now. Uh, we've been received very well, and I always remember those days uh, very nice, as very nice. Our relationship with the Japanese uh, um, leaders, Professor Tetsukano, visited Jordan, is a great friend of mine. You know, Sano also visited Jordan, and I visited him and his unit. Yoko Kato, we traveled the world all over in, in the education committee. She's very active, very strong lady. Uh, this is with uh, Professor Takeshi Kawase here. We are in Mount Fuji, where he invited us for the Skull Base uh, Conference. And this is my wife and his wife. They are very close friends. Uh, also, giants of uh, neurosurgery visited Jordan. Uh, this is Professor Drake, who visited us back in 1992. Lindsay Simon, Professor Yezerji, Albert Rotem, Spitzler, he, he is in my house here. Uh, Professor Roberto Heroes, uh, uh, Rivera, Yoha, uh, Professor Sami, Professor Mifti, uh, Marcos, uh, Konvalov, uh, Atos de Souza, late Atos de Souza, Ed Blows, Eliam Shaker, Nelson Oseko, and so many, many Indian and Asian uh, colleagues of mine, which I have a great relationship and great friendship uh, with them. Uh, across the years. So now I think we'll stop the, uh, the, the presentation about Jordan and we'll go to the clinoidal meningiomas, as I said, from the many aspects that we described. So they are formidable and they are challenging. They are not easy uh, regions. Uh, what is an anterior clinoidal meningioma? It is a meningioma arising in the vicinity of the anterior clinoid process, but they can extend to the medial surrounding ring, the paracellular area, to the cavernous sinus, to the posterior clinoid, to the vitroclival area. And here, when they do that, uh, starts the problem of uh, nomination for these uh, cases. Uh, when they attain large size, you cannot really tell whether they are cavernous meningiomas or sphenocavernous meningioma, but the motto here is, if more than two thirds of the tumor is extra cavernous, it is a clinoidal. Professor Sandy published this paper 2005 about the terional the outer third, the middle third, and the inner third uh, of meningiomas. And this we are talking about these sphenocavernous meningioma, including the anterior clinoidal meningioma. Professor John Tu from New York, from USA, 
also describe this as sphenocavernous, which is referring to the anterior clinoid, uh, clinoidal cavernous or sphenocavernous, so they are the same uh, group. Professor Al Mifti back in 1990, he said, well, we have three types of these meningiomas. Uh, this is the anterior clinoid process. If you are medial to it, this is the most difficult uh, tumor. This is type one. Type two is easy. It's coming from the outer aspect. And type three is in the middle because it is lying on the optic canal. So this is type one, uh, which is a difficult one because you cannot dissect the carotid artery. Type two, you are on the lateral aspect, you can. And type three, you are sitting on the roof of the optic canal. Also, this beautiful paper from USA 2009 about the uh, meningioma anatomical relationship and where is the tumor coming from, the medial side, the inner side, and so on. So they classify them into four types. Type one, where the origin of the tumor is from the superior surface of the anterior clinoid process, like this, like this. Type two was separated into two types, type 2A and type 2B. Type 2A, you are arising from, or the meningioma is arising from the lateral surface of the anterior clinoid. Type 2B, it's arising from the tip of the anterior clinoid. And type 3, it's arising from the medial surface of the anterior clinoid, but above the distal ring. So it does not really go into the cavernous sinus. While type 4, it is difficult to identify. It goes into the cavernous sinus and it takes the anterior clinoid and the cavernous sinus. And usually, blood vessels are encased inside it. Uh, this paper from USA 2017 describing the vascular en encasement in sphenoid wing meningiomas, usually the medial type. So we are speaking about how many of the carotid is encased, so the degree of encasement. So this is total encasement of the uh, carotid. And this is what you are going to face if you are doing surgery for this kind of tumors. So let's look at the anterior planar process from the anatomy. And here, my word of caution for young neurosurgeons and residents, you don't only have to know the anatomy of the anterior clinoid, you have also to know the variations of the anatomy. So anterior clinoid is part of the uh, sphenoid bone, uh, lizard wing of a sphenoid bone, greater wing of a sphenoid bone. Uh, so anterior clinoid is in the lizard wing of a sphenoid bone. We have greater wing and we have the body and of course from the body dangling the medial lateral tergoid uh, plates. Remember the optic canal in relationship to the anterior clinoid, and this is the optic strut, which is a part of the anterior clinoid process. So we think of anterior clinoid process as a small area. It's large, it's really huge. It is made of tip, it's made head, body, and base. This is just to make us respect this tiny structure, which is not tiny, this is giant. So this paper about the classification of the parts. This is the tip, this is the head, this is the body and the base of the sphenoid bone of the anterior clinoid. The tip, head, body and base. And from the base, which is here, comes two processes, this one and this one, anterior and posterior, and they surround and make the optic canal. So this posterior process is the optic strut. And this is, of course, the cavernous sinus. So here you are, the optic strut, lower border of the optic canal, and the optic canal is there. So two processes, one anterior and one posterior to make the optic canal. And here is the spear of the fissure. Again, here relationship of the anterior clinoid to the nerve, to the artery, to the third nerve. And here, if you drill the anterior clinoid, you come to the clinoidal segment of the carotid. This is distal ring and proximal ring. Again, you have to remember as abnormal anatomy, the medial, middle clinoid process, which sometimes you face, you have to remember that this is present in about 12% of cases. What's the relationship of the anterior clinoid process? Of course, the major relationship is with the uh, carotid artery because we speak about the clinoidal segment of the 
carotid, which is hidden by the anterior clinoid. So the distal ring, the um, proximal ring, the relationship with the anterior clinoidal process. Here is the uh, relationship with the optic nerve, the falciform ligament, uh, third nerve, the cavernous sinus. Again, if you remove the anterior clinoid, you'll come to the clinoidal segment of the carotid. Uh, important relationship is the ophthalmic artery, which is coming from the dorsal aspect of the carotid and goes in. But this is the normal anatomy. There is abnormal anatomy where the ophthalmic artery may actually start inside the distal ring rather than outside it, or even go into the sphere orbital fissure. So this is the uh, normal way of ophthalmic artery. Rising distal to the ring, it goes above it and goes into the optic canal goes this way, which is lateral to the optic and then cross and becomes medial to it. But here, the ophthalmic artery is arriving between the distal and proximal ring. And here, it has nothing to do with the proximal. It is going through the severe orbital tissue. Again, if you want to operate in any area, you don't want only to know the anatomy, but you want to know the abnormal anatomy and the abnormal variations. So here we are, the optic nerve, this is the carotid, this is oblique view to show you the uh, thalamic artery. Also the third nerve and relationship to the anterior clinoid into the uh, cisternal segment, the cavernous segment and into the severe position, dividing into two upper and lower uh, branches of divisions. So also you have to know all the triangles of the uh, cavernous sinus if you want to operate in this area operating on anterior clinoidal meningioma. Uh, the structures that you come across and they have very strong relationship with the uh, anterior clinoid is the middle superficial uh, vein, uh, cerebral vein, and it can actually drain into this phenoparietal sinus. It can drain a different sort of uh, away from that. So you have to remember uh, this kind of relationship, very valuable. So one of the things that you face if you want to deal with the anterior clinoidal process is this kind of divisions from the superficial middle cerebral vein going into the sphenoparietal sinus. You may face one branch, you may face different branches, but it is there, it is attached to the tumor, it is in your face, so you have to know uh, how to deal with this. Uh, if we look at the anterior clinoidal process radiology, this is the normal radiology. But sometimes it is aerated. And if it is aerated, it means that some part of the optic strut is open for air to come from the sphenoid sinus into the anterior clinoid. So you will see it like this. This is normal, this is abnormal. Here, optic strut is okay. Here, optic strut is aerated. Type two, where you have bilateral aeration, and type three, bilateral radiation, but with lots of uh, variations. Uh, radiology is like this. This is normal. This is optic canal here. It is very enlarged in these anterior clinoidal meningiomas. If you do CT, you can see the difference between the normal left where the optic canal is there, optic canal there, but look at this. Uh, and you can actually do it pre-op and post-op. This is when we drill the anterior clinoid process, and this is post operative And geography is mandatory. We need to know all these blood vessels coming where because the blood vessel, the blood supply of these meningiomas is variable, coming from different uh, arteries, including the ophthalmic artery, directly or through the posterior ethmoidal artery. Uh, in this case, for example, you can see the carotid, you can see ophthalmic going into the canal lateral aspect of the optic jumping on top of the optic to go and divide into posterior and anterior ethmoidal. Here you can see it is not seen, it is not visualized uh, because there is a tumor there. Uh, we do venography and this particular case, this case is a case of mine and also this one. We need to see the severe ophthalmic vein draining this region into the cavernous sinus. What about optical canal or optic canal involvement? Uh, you can judge that. This is normal. You can see optic nerve and the subarachnoid space around it. Here, you can see that the optic 
and that is invoked by this uh, tune. Uh, also, you can see here the interior client of the Joma going into the optic canal. Paper from USA 2008 about high incidence of optic canal involvement in clinodermal meningioma. So you have to teach yourself how to deal with this optic canal involvement by not only drilling of the anterior clinoid, but also by opening of the optic canal and take the dura away and remove it. So the blood supply of this anterior clinoidal meningioma comes from various parts, middle meningeal, meningeorbital, meningeorbital band and artery, Stereochmoidal, thumb arch directly, or triggers from the bifurcation of the internal carotid artery. Look at that. This is a twig coming from the carotid going directly into the anterior clinoid. And this would tend to be hypertrophic if you have an anterior clinoid in the You can see here these direct twigs from the carotid artery. Uh, you can visualize this uh, blood supply. This is a very nice paper by Michael McDermott from San Francisco. He's a meningioma man, and he showed this intercalinal meningioma before and after. Here you can see the blood supply, and here you can see with the ICG post-operative. So CT angio is also mandatory. You can see lots of details and relationship uh, before you start your surgery. As in this case, you can see the, uh, how vascular it is in the tumor blush. Uh, this is tumor blush on conventional angiogram, and this is uh, after embolization. Can this anterior clinoidal meningioma be associated with any lesions? Yes, can be associated with aneurysms or basal meningiomas. Uh, so this is one paper showing this association between anterior clinoidal meningioma and aneurysms. Also this paper showing the association between the anterior clinoid and the aneurysm. So you have to be careful about these things. How do they present? They present usually with headache, uh, orbital proptosis, cover the sinus cranial nerves, uh, affection in neuropathies, tumor lobe epilepsy, and midbrain hemiparesis. So variable according to the size and the uh, direction or growth of the tumor. Microsurgery remains the uh, mainstay of the treatment of these tumors. And I must say that if you want to operate in this region, you have to be highly technical. It is not a job for the novices or the beginners. And the approach could be frontoorbital, frontoorbital zygomatic, terional, extended terional. I love this terional and extended terional, and I use the same method like Vincro Dallin's use. Uh, but I have to rem remind you that anterior clinodectomy as a procedure was described by Charles Drake, uh, who visited Jordan uh, uh, twice, but he described this back in 68. Prostagazia G described at 77, Vinca Dolans uh, described extradural drilling of the anterior clinoid. So you can drill the anterior clinoid intradural or extradural. And you can use the sonopet for that, you can use the usual drill, or you can use the micro ranger. Compare this anterior clinoid with this that has been removed. So the greater wing has been drilled, the anterior clinoid has been removed. Here, the anterior clinoid has been removed. Question that Michael McDermott and uh, Sugru uh, presented to us saying, is it wise to drill out the optic canal? And the answer is definitely yes. And I will show this in my videos. So all in all across the, across the board in literature, if you look at the literature, you'll find that the gross total resection is 43 to 91% with rather high uh, incidence of recurrence. That's across the board uh, in literature. Some of the authors and the number of patients and the gross total and the mortality and morbidity. A very nice paper by Felix Szymanski from Israel. Uh, and he showed this very beautiful paper of large pinoidal meningiomas. Uh, this paper also described in 2011 lateral supraorbital approach for anterior clinoidal 
and in Germany from Finland. Uh, early optic nerve decompression. Don't wait to see if there's a tumor there, you go and early decompress the uh, optic uh, canal. This is from Japan, 2018. And this paper from Russia about the results of surgical treatment of patients with anterior clinoidal meningiomas, large size meningiomas, and the recommendation that there is no difference between total removal, which is this, or subtotal removal of this, and subtotal removal with uh, radiotherapy. So these are almost uh, identical. What about endoscopy? Can we remove anterior clinoidal meningiomas with endoscopy? Endoscopy, in endoscopy, lies the future of neurosurgery. It's so much expanding, it's so much pushing the envelope, so much uh, giving us this beautiful uh, presentations and beautiful papers. So endoscopy is, uh, is powerful, uh, but the papers about the use of the anterior clinoidal meningioma are still very scarce. Uh, this is one of them, 2017, in uh, neuro-oncology, uh, Surgical Neurology International. Uh, so uh, endoscopists are getting the courage to go into the, the orbit. What about radiosurgery? Because of the intimate relationship with the optic nerve, radiosurgery may not be that useful unless you have uh, recurrence. Uh, this uh, uh, recent paper from Turkey showing the anterior clinoidal meningioma being treated with gamma ray. So I'm gonna to speak to you now about my series. I had, I operated upon 60 patients, but I've lost follow-up uh, on 18. And the ones I have long follow-up, I'm presenting to you, 42 cases. And this is the period between 1990 and 2018. You may say, what, what about the last two years? I say, I don't include the last two years in any study I make about meningiomas, you need to have at least two years to include them in your uh, study. So I have a larger numbers actually, but I have to wait on the follow-up. Uh, females, of course, are more than males. This is the peak age, 40 to 50, but the mean age is 45. And this is some of my cases. I used, I put, putting to you the coronal uh, cuts so that you can appreciate these uh, lesions. This is my series of patients. Again, here you can see that the vessels are inside it. And this sometimes gives you heartache because you think, oh, I'm not going to excise it, but with patients you can. You can see these different uh, anterior clinoidal meningiomas, small ones and large ones. Again, here you can see what visits are inside it, and you may decide that this is not resectable. I'll prove to you that it can be resected. So these are some of uh, my cases on the coronal views. So the symptoms in my series, visual dysfunction was the commonest presentation, 26. Papilledema 11, headaches, major manifestations, cognitive problems 4, seizures 7, hemiparesis in 3. And once we have the patient in, we do full ophthalmological assessment because optic nerve and care is very much related to these tumors. So we do everything visual acuity, visual fields, fondoscopy, optic nerve OCT, exothermos measurements. So this is the kind of investigations we do for all patients. And we use the German visual score. We combine visual activity and visual defect and come up with a score. Do that before surgery and after surgery. We can use the visual responses also. Also, I insist that my patients in brain surgery must be psychologically assessed. We do Karnofsky performance scale for all patients whenever it is available and whenever we can do it. I will show you some of the images in my series. Uh, show you what the CT scan in my series shows. You can see, as I said, the enlargement and the uh, infiltration of the tumor. 
It was usually, in the past, it was called hyperostosis. We know now it is a tumor infiltration. We don't use the word hyperostosis at all. So CT will show you this uh, bone infiltration and bone changes. This is all from my series. Uh, here in the uh, sagittal, you can see the tumor and the infiltration. The MRI, uh, we use sometimes the Fiesta uh, techniques to see the whole length of the optic nerve. And in this particular case, the tumor was made of a hard part in the anterior process and the soft part. Uh, believe you me, this lady, uh, she, she's, she comes to me every year from the United Arab Emirates, and she only complained of headache. And I've been following her up, up for 10 years now, and there has been no change in this picture whatsoever. So it tells you that if the symptoms are minor, even if the, um, the image is ugly, maybe you may wait. MRA, MRB are essentials. They are part, to, for me, it is part of the MRI. MRI, MRA, MRB, they, goes, they go together. And if there is need, we go for, as I said, angiography to see the proper blood supply and the uh, tumor blush. Venography, as I said, is essential. Uh, Terrional 27 cases, from to orbital 15 cases in my series. I've achieved Simpson grade 1 to 2 in 22 patients, Simpson grade 3, 17 patients, Simpson grade 4, 3 patients. I followed up these patients for a minimum of 24. You can see a minimum of 24. I will never include any patient in any study unless there is a period of 24 months. And when we follow them up for this period, there was residual in 20 cases. Remember, they are 42, 20 of them, they had residual. And for those residual, we don't jump on radiation. We observe, we may do a surgery again, or we may do gamma knife. And the follow-up, no residual was 22 cases. Again, you see whether they progress or not. There was no residual, but yet here, four cases progressed, four cases develop the tumor. Again, you can wait, you can do surgery, you can do gamma knife. What about the visual outcome? You remember that the visual presentation was the commonest uh, in my series, 26 improved, static 14, and worse than two. And somebody may ask, why did it not improve? Because you have affected the blood supply, the tumor has affected the blood supply of the optic apparatus, that it is irreversible. The prolonged period of pressure, the severe pressure, even if you do surgery, sometimes the vision does not improve. Complications, luckily I had no mortality, but I have my share of morbidity. CSF leak was the commonest. Epilepsy also, some pyramidal weakness, dysphagia, ptosis, cognitive functions. And the Kiki Turel is running a very nice complication in courses where we, this is one slide telling you about my complications, but then with Kiki, we go and dis discuss the complications in details. Last week, we discussed, uh, was participating with the rupture of uh, aneurysm, PCOM aneurysm, I was putting the clip and it ruptured, so we presented this as a complication in details. Uh, this is one of the complications, uh, CSF leak and uh, pneumocele, uh, but without meningitis. And uh, we published this paper, myself and my colleague, Dr. Hussam Farsa from the uh, uh, medical lab in Jordan. Uh, we looked at the last consecutive 244 meningiomas, uh, and we studied them. We studied the bone invasion and uh, compared it in various grades. We studied necrosis in grade one, two, and three. We studied the mitotic count in these cases, the P53 and 63, and see how they compare in various grades, P53 and P63. And we looked at progesterone receptors in grade one, two, and three. This paper was published in the American Academy of Pathology, uh, published first as a paper, uh, um, as an abstract and then published as a paper. Okay, 67 in various grades. 
And what we found is this, this is the summary. The grade one was common in females, but look at this, grade two and three were common in males. So although females number are more than males, yet when, when you have as a male, uh, clinoidal meningioma, you may get grade two or three. And of course, the higher TI, TI 67 is the worst, the higher P53 is the worst, the lower progesterone is the worst. And we have shown this in details in our paper published in the American Academy of Pathology. Let me show you some of the illustrative cases and then we'll go straight to the videos. Uh, uh, this is the uh, case, a 70 year old Iraqi uh, lady coming with this extensive tumor. This is post operative and this is the follow up. Uh, 55, sorry, this is not the same lady. A 60 year old um, female, uh, Jordanian with this tumor. Again, pre-operative and post-operative and the follow-up. Uh, this lady also uh, from uh, Palestine, from the uh, Palestinian Authority, 45-year-old lady with this tumor that we have removed. And again, this lady from Iraq with this tumor before and after surgery and the follow-up. And as I said, this case, which we, I think this is, cannot be excised. Look at the vessels inside it. But, you know, with, with, with continuity and being very careful, you can actually remove it. This is immediate post-operative, total resection. And this is very long follow-up. I mean, about uh, nine years of follow-up without any recurrence. A 55-year-old lady with the uh, male patient with this uh, anterior clinoidal meningioma pre and post operative, 49 year old female patient with this extensive tumor. One of the videos I'm gonna show is this lady, where I will show you the difficulty in dealing with the superficial middle cerebral veins going into the sphenoparietal sinus. Again, here are the vessels inside the tumor and the possibility of radical excision. 63 year old female patient uh, from Saudi Arabia with this tumor before and after surgery. 34 year old female lady with this very uh, horrifying tumor before and after surgery. So uh, I'm showing you some of the recurrences. Uh, 45 year old uh, female patient with this tumor uh, that we excised. There may be a remnant here which we followed and she developed recurrence. Uh, she refused to have any further treatment. Uh, this man, from a Jordanian man, he came with ptosis because the tumor was really involving everywhere. We excised a very good uh, result with some uh, residual here. The sternum nerve improved post-operative and we gave him, uh, when he had the, when the current seven years later, we gave him gamma radiation. As you remember, as you remember we had gamma knife since 19, uh, uh, about 25, 26 years now. Again, this tumor with the tumor of last year, you can see how the uh, vessels are stretched. And we did the embolization beforehand and the excision, there was still residual. She did well, she's a, a actually Jordanian professor of English uh, literature. And she developed recurrence. We gave her gamma knife. And in spite of that, she progressed. So steps of surgery in a hurry. Uh, Terrional approach. I use the uh, Vincotolin-Dolens technique. Uh, I drill the greater wing of sphenoid. This is frontal. This is temporal. I uh, reach to the anterior clinoid process. I drill it extradurally. And I try to open the severe orbital fissure. Here we are drilling trying to open uh, the anterior clinoid process. I open the roof of the orbit if the roof is involved. And then I go intradural, open the dura. And this is the picture that you face if you are going terional. And uh, here you'll face a tumor, which is surrounding these vessels here, carotid anterior uh, cerebral, middle cerebral. Uh, it looks like formidable, but at the end of the day, you can 
uh, drill the anterior clinoid or whatever is remaining from the anterior clinoid intradurally. Uh, so drill it completely, remove the anterior clinoid, and then open the optic canal and uh, try to remove the tumor completely. So optic nerve carotid, and this, uh, these are the veins going into the uh, uh, into the sinus, sphenoparietal sinus. And then the closure, reconstruction by duragine and glue, and the bony reconstruction uh, as seen post-operative. So let's see the a few videos. It will not take time, just about maybe seven, eight minutes. Uh, and then we are ready to take any questions. So uh, this is a function, this is temporal, and this is a great ring of sphenoid. You dissect the dura and you trying to uh, open the way for yourself and then go in. And here you will face, as I said, the branches of the middle uh, cerebral artery and the middle cerebral vein. And you have to be patient. Uh, don't uh, decide uh, prematurely that it cannot be dissected. Just keep at it. So this is the carotid and this is middle and this is the pecum. So here we are at the edge of the tent and some of the tumor is going there. You can see the optic nerve there, you can see the vein. So here we are. Uh, here we are drilling the, uh, the sphenoid wing to open the superior orbital fissure here. I've used the drill, I'm using now the arrangeur. I want to open this. This is the superior orbital fissure. This is the main orbital band. And of course the optic nerve and canal are here. Copious uh, C line so that you will have no thermal injuries and insisting on opening the severe orbital fissure because I said they can present with proptosis and if you don't open uh, the severe orbital fissure then it is a problem. Here is the final picture whereby you can see the optic nerve, you can see the severe orbital fissure has been opened and you can see the uh, roof of the orbit also has been opened. Here is to show you the drilling of the uh, climate process extradurally. You can see the optic canal. We have drilled it completely. You can see the optic nerve. You can see olfactory tract. So that helps a lot in uh, decreasing the recurrence rate. You can see the optic nerve here. Here is the intradural uh, drilling of the uh, anterior clinoid. Last piece is the most difficult and sometimes it is really stuck to the carotid, you have to be careful. But once you remove it, you will see the uh, superior surface of the carotid, the clinoid segment, as in here. Uh, this is the uh, dura surrounding the anterior clinoid with the distal ring, so you open it. Trying to achieve symptom grade one or two as you can. This is the uh, third nerve at the edge of the tent. Uh, intradural drilling of the anterior clinoid and the opening of the optic canal. This is the optic nerve here. We always preserve the olfactory tract. Here we are opening the, the canal itself and the dura surrounding the canal, looking for any tumor that can be there. Here in this case, intradural drilling of the anterior clinoid or the planum sphenoidale. And here I'll show you that there is a tumor going into the canal. You can see the ophthalmic artery here, as you can see here. So this is the ophthalmic artery coming from the uh, carotid. So if you do not open this canal, then you have a problem. Also the tumor can extend into the thalamus femidale 
this is optic canal being opened, but look at this tumor inside the optic canal. This is the one drilled, the one drilled, and here is the tumor inside the optic canal. Again, here you are aiming at radical excision if you can. If you can't, you can't, you accept defeat. But because you don't want just to produce good images, you want to preserve the patient and try to give them the best chance possible. If the tumor is going into the sonar sinus, I don't hesitate in drilling the hole of the plantar sonidale and reconstruct the sinus. Uh, this is uh, the film that I promised to show you, which is the lady for this anterior clinoidal meningioma. And you can see the veins going into the sphere orbital sinus. And you have to preserve and work in between the branches of the superficial middle cerebral vein and the branches of the uh, middle cerebral artery. This is the sphere of right here. You have to be patient and work in between, separate these branches of the middle cerebral because they are uh, going uh, in pass and they would supply certain area of the brain. Here you can see that we are separating it from the main trunk of the middle cerebral and from the carotid artery. Again, perseverance, being patient. This is not a time for the mediocre surgeons or for a speedy Gonzalez surgeon. This is where uh, you have to give the, chance, the, in the best chance for the patient. You are trying to find a plane of equilibrium between the tumor and the carotid, working between the veins and so on. So free piece by piece and excise it. You can see the vessels here. So still attached, some arachnoid here. So we can now remove it and preserve these vessels. And then come into the lateral wall of the cavern sinus and remove the tumor from there. So here's the final picture. Here, just to show you this uh, very ugly tumor that we saw earlier on, where it was encasing the internal carotid artery. Again, in the beginning, there was no plane of equilibrium, but gradually we could develop this plane of equilibrium. This is the anterior clinoid, and this is the carotid, this is the optic. So the tumor was in the optical carotid uh, triangle, also going laterally into the posterior fossa. So this is the carotid anterior cerebral, middle cerebral here. You can see the pecan also being encased by the tumor, but by being patient, you can find a plane of cleavage working between the carotid and the optic using the ultrasonic aspirator. And here you will find the stoke, this is the stoke being preserved, this is the tumor that has been removed, so you can actually preserve its blood supply. And you can see the liquid membrane here, and you can see the bezel. So still a piece of a tumor. Now going back to the pecum, so we free the tumor here on the medial aspect, we go back to the lateral aspect, we can see the pecum and the anterior corridor, both will be preserved. So what looks to be impossible now is coming to be possible, just because one should be patient and give the patient the best chance possible. First time is the best time. Uh, so we follow the tumor into the posterior fossa. This is pecom and anterior colloidal is here. And as I said, you can see now the basal and so on. Okay. Uh, sometimes I said the overflow into the supracellular area. This is separating the tumor from uh, A1, here is A2, here is ACOM. So again, by being patient, you have to separate these from the major structures. As you can see, A2, A2, ACOM here, A1 here. Piece by piece, patients.
after chiasm being freed, the arachnoid being towards the vital structures, not taking away from them. And you can see now the nerve, the chiasm, olfactory transfer and preserve, or the uh, optic, the uh, uh, tetary stalk. And here is some tumor uh, that is going into the canal. So it has to be opened. And you have also to remove this dura to accomplish Simpson grade one. So here I'm using that mean to determine the dura and use the rotten dissector to take this uh, piece of dura down to the uh, pituitary gland. Uh, with this, I uh, finish the the videos. And just one last slide that I want to present. Uh, Mandela, South Africa. I'm quoting him saying, after climbing a great hill, one only finds that there are many more hills to, to, to climb. So uh, the, the challenge does not stop, uh, especially for the young neurosurgeons. Thank you very much indeed. Thank you, Professor Ibrahim, and uh, for your uh, excellent lecture. Uh -huh. Thank you. And uh, we can find uh, Jordan is a beautiful country. Uh, you mentioned anatomy and uh, radiology of anterograde process and uh, many operative uh, movie. And uh, can I have a question? Please do. You usually uh, use approach uh, extradurally uh, crinodectomy. I do both, extradurally and intradurally, so I use both. If I want to do uh, yes. crinodectomy, I start by extradural, drilling the greater wing, so that to make the pathway for me, and then drill most of the, uh, the anterior clinoid extradurally. But once I go in, I complete it and take the, uh, the clinoid, anterior clinoid process intradurally. So I use both. Okay, thank you. And... Uh... Uh, I can see uh, your operation uh, to pre preserve the perforator, uh, especially yes. anterior crinoid, uh, yes, anterior choroidal artery. And, and uh, please, please lecture us to the chips to uh, preserve the uh, sure. perforator. I, I don't open the periorbita if the orbit is involved, unless the tumor goes inside. The orbita is very strong and it is resistant for invasion of the tumor. I've seen very few cases where the tumor actually went in, and that mostly in the sphenoorbital orbital meningioma rather than sphenoorbital cavernous meningioma. So I do everything I can to preserve the periorbita, because once you preserve it, you don't need to do reconstruction whatsoever. You don't need to do bony reconstruction or any kind of reconstruction. How can you find the uh, hardness of the tumor preoperatively. Yeah, it is said that if you look at the MRI, you can judge the consistency of the tumor. I came to this conclusion. Almost all of the skull-based tumors are usually hard. So it is not only hard for a patient to have skull-based tumor, also the consistency is hard. You can find the soft consistency in the cortical meningiomas, but I've never seen a soft tumor and the skull base. They are always either firm or hard. The decision by T2 image? Yes, you can MRI. judge, but, but it is most time time is misleading. So I don't trust the MRI to tell me the consistency. If it's a very big tumor, uh, some tumor in case the ICA and the MCA, sure. and uh, sometimes tumor invasion to the I see a uh, wall. Yes. How can you find the, uh, you can dissect? Yes. Or uh, it's impossible? How can you find? Well, what, what I do is that I don't decide before surgery, preoperative, that this tumor mm -hmm. cannot be dissected. Although I can see on the MRI, on MRI that the carotid, the middle cerebral, the anterior cerebral are inside it. I just decide when I go in. I go in. And a patient trying to find the plane of the cleavage. If I find it, I continue. If it is invading the wall, I stop. One cannot be courageous on the expense of the patient, but one should be courageous if there is a good plane of the cleavage. So I insist on giving the chance for the patient 
by just trying to find the plane of cleavage. This is something I do intraoperative and not preoperative. Okay, I see. Thank you very much. And uh, let's open the discussion from sure. the audience. Yeah, sure. Thank you. Thank you, Professor Siva. That was a great lecture. And what a fine brand ambassador you have been to your beautiful country. Thank you very much for giving us such a beautiful lecture. I shall now open this platform for discussion. First of all, uh, I would like to ask you a question that uh, most of the patients who come for this middle phenolgrin meningiomas and anoral meningiomas, they come for cosmetic reasons, right? They come with uh, proptosis and they they expect them to be cured postoperatively with uh, uh, recession of this proptosis. In what percentage of cases have you achieved this result? Uh, as you said, the visual manifestations, whether being uh, visual defects or decrease in visual acuity or proptosis, are some of the manifestations of the visual presentation of this tumor. If you open the severe orbital fissure properly, 80-85% of the patients will improve. But the, the trick and the secret is to open the superior orbital fissure. Because the superior ophthalmic vein, the inferior ophthalmic vein passing from there to the cavernous sinus. If you open it, then that's that's the secret of decreasing their exothermes. And uh, the second question is, you, you told that you do not decide on preoperatively whether there is a plane of cleavage between the internal carotid and... Yeah. So if there is a plane of cleavage, you go on. But if there is not, you said you would abandon the surgery. No, then, I would not. No, I would, would not still, abandon the surgery. I would still go in yeah. for so many uh, uh, parts of the tumor that you can remove. But okay. inside, I would decide whether I find the plane of cleavage, I will continue till the end, or I accept the feet that the tumor is really encasing the carotid, and I stop. Yeah, but I've but never you, canceled you, surgery, you never canceled surgery based on uh, pre-operative judgment. I always go in and try to find it. Because I tell you, all these classifications that we mentioned, that the tumor is arising from the inner aspect, or tumor is arising from the severe aspect, or tumor arising from the outer aspect, for me, this is just uh, literature. You cannot decide preoperative whether this is type 1, 2, or 3. You only decide this after surgery. Was, uh, well, the most important part of the growth of the tumor was coming from inside aspect of the, uh, the anterior clinoid. So this is type 1, according to MFT. You decide this during surgery and after surgery, not before surgery. Right. Thank you. So there are so many people who are waiting to ask you so many sure. questions. Uh, yeah, I would like to call upon Dr. Tinu Ravi Abraham. Dr. Tinu. Yes, thank you, Raja. It was a very great presentation uh, mm -hmm. by uh, Dr. Ibrahim. So my um, question to you is regarding the any predictors for assessing resectability of the tumor preoperatively. One is regarding the plane you have answered. Any other factors you decide? Uh, before uh, been, uh, predicting for the uh, resectability of the tumor. I think you are referring to a very famous paper by Atul Gowell, a uh, very famous paper about the predictors of accession of uh, anterior clinoidal meningioma. As I said, you can never decide before that, beforehand, what, what you are going to face. You always decide after that. But the plane of the cleavage, the encasement of the blood vessels, the direction of the growth of the tumor in, through the tent into the posterior posture will give you an idea about the difficulty of doing this surgery. But the more difficulty you face, the more courageous you feel that I want to conquer this tumor. You know what I do is to consider the tumor as my enemy. So when I go in, my residents and my staff know that I curse and shout at the tumor. I made this mental uh, situation where I am fighting with the enemy the enemy wants to take the patient from me. I want to save this uh, the patient. So creating this high adrenaline kind of situation would help you to give the patient the best chance possible. So there are some predictors, but the best predictor is once you go in and try to remove the tumor. Dr. T. N. Rao. Good yeah. evening. So the excellent uh, presentation, excellent technique, and uh, there needs uh, good anatomy knowledge and the uh, patience of the surgeon. I have some doubts, sir. Huh? 
then the anticlinal meningeum having the there is thickened anticlinal process where it needs extradural intradural and uh, how to follow the tumor engulfing the ici from the distal to medial proximal proximal to distal how to first to catch the ici sir sure uh, as i said if you are really dealing with anterior meningeal meningeum first thing is to try to open the cell vein fissure preserve the branches of the middle uh, superficial intercellular vein going into the, the sinus, sphenoparietal sinus. And then you start with an area where the middle cerebral is not involved and then follow. So I start from distal to proximal. Once I find uh, an artery, so whether it is middle cerebral or anterior cerebral, I follow it to take me to the, to the carotid. And then there you decide there is a plane of cleavage or not. Okay, thank you, sir. Thank you. Professor Kimura, are you here? I'm Hideshito Kimura. Yeah, thank you for your nice, excellent presentation. Thank you. Uh, so I'm so surprised, experience. Uh, and so especially in you, sh you show the case number nine is a tumor so tightly adhered to the pickle artery and the anterior artery. You, you successfully removed it totally, preserving the anterior artery, uh, posterior communicating artery. Very nice technique. You showed us. Uh, okay. Very nice. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you. So I have one question. So, sure. so you have just a few cases uh, uh, the suffering the post-operative deterioration of the visual acuity. So do you exp uh, explain about the uh, clinical details, uh, characteristic details, uh, uh, suffering the post-operative deterioration of the visual acuity? Yes, yes. Okay. Uh, of course, I do very detailed consent form. Uh, we don't have sort of general uh, um, uh, consent form for everybody. Our consent form is tailored for that particular patient. Mm -hmm. So I don't believe in any uh, prepared consent form. I hereby give the authority for the doctors to do this, that, and the other. This is a generalized consent form. I use a very special consent form that is tailored according to the patient. So there are no consent forms that are equal or similar to each other. Every patient has a consent form which is different from the others. I explain in details and I write it in a very clear language, Arabic or English, that we are, our aim is to remove the tumor completely if we can. If we can't, we have to, re to, to leave some tumors. And I would say this, and I learned this from my training in England, a very nice sentence. It says, the complications include, but not exclusively, of the following. So I mentioned some of the complications, but I cannot explain every complication. And one of the complications I say that you may have deterioration of your vision. And if that happens, we have to accept it. But I have to do my duty. I have to preserve the arachnoid. I have to preserve these tiny blood vessels of going to the tumor. And I showed in my presentation how many arteries can actually give blood supply to the tumor and to the optic apparatus. Mm -hmm. So yes, you may get deterioration of vision, you may get the, some of the patients, they have no change in their vision, and some of them would improve. But I have, uh, I think, three cases uh, where deterioration of vision mm -hmm. occurred, and this was permanent in one and temporary in two. Mm -hmm. Liu? Hello? Yes. Yeah, yeah, Liu. Hello. Hello, Prof. Uh, thank you for a nice uh, presentation. Uh, I have mainly two questions here. Sure. Uh, uh, in between uh, uh, extradural, uh, an intradural bone work, uh, I would ask uh, for a large tumor, uh, would uh, drainage of a CSF from the cistern uh, uh, allow a more uh, retraction uh, 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 of the dura to, for the bony work? And if we do uh, extradurally, would you find that when you open intradurally, the, the tumor will be less vascular and uh, much more easier to remove? Absolutely right. Absolutely. That's why I start with the extra dural drilling, because by doing so, you are taking most of the blood supply of the tumor, except for the pile vessels that are coming from the surface of the brain or from the carotid directly or the cerebral directly. But doing the bony work extra durally, by the time you go in, you'll find that the intracranial pressure has much decreased and the brain is lax. In addition, when you uh, also drain some CSF from the CSF systems, and that would help you further. And then you continue. And I, or as I said, I, use, I do both extra dural sinodectomy, and then I continue into dural to remove uh, the last piece of the, of the uh, My second question, Prof. 
uh, in in the tumor that you show with encasing the MCA and ICA, uh, in in which case that you may think that uh, preoperative or uh, bypass surgery and uh, uh, bypass surgery is needed, and or you think that uh, in those cases usually uh, uh, collateral have been well formed and there's no role of bypass in those cases. And uh, do you find that any at any point of time when you, you remove the tumor, some of the vessels are already thrombosed in, intraoperatively? Thank you, Prof. Sure. Um, I would never think of bypass surgery in these tumors because you only need bypass if you have some blockage of vessels. Once yes. the vessel is there, even if it is stretched, even if it is so much narrowed, I would never go for a bypass surgery. Bypass surgery is not easy. There are complications for it. It is extra surgery that you do. So what I do is to not to do that or think of bypass surgery. And the second part of your question, how many times did I see that the vessels are thrombosed? I've never seen a thrombosed vessel or a blockage of vessels. But as I said, some of the things that I was really going in and I had the feeling that I'm not going to be able to take the tumor out. And then you go in and then you find the plane of the You just pursue that. Uh, then many sort of doors and windows open for you and you proceed. But what I'm telling myself, I will not be courageous on the expense of the patient. My aim is not to produce good post-operative pictures. My aim is to produce good post-operative pictures and good clinical condition. Yes, Christian Permana. Yes, I'm here. Yeah. Okay, uh, Professor, I have one question. In what uh, type of cases do you do the embolization preoperatively? It's a very good question. I've always been asked about this, whether I'm presenting a parasitical meningioma or a clinoidal meningioma. The answer is very, very few. Uh, embolization carries a risk, especially in this kind of, of tumors, because people do not think about the hidden anastomosis between the branches of the middle of the ophthalmic artery and the meningeal artery and other arteries. This is very important, and flowback can cause loss of vision, it can cause blockage of the internal carotid artery. So, only in cases where I feel that the vascularity of the tumor is very much so that even if you give two, three, four units of blood transfusion, that you need to do the embolization. And ask any skull-based surgeon from Osama Nifty to George Bernard to anybody that embolization should be limited to very few cases, especially the giant ones and the ones that you see that they are really very vascular. So embolization is not an essential part of the treatment of these cases. It should be considered very carefully, and in those cases where you have a giant tumor with a very, very rich blood supply, because it has own, own complications. And I tell you something, that in cases where I have done the embolization, I thought that the blood, the, the blood loss would be less. It was horrible still. So it does not really serve much purpose to do embolization, except in very limited situations. Professor Maturia? Yes, I am there. Yes. Yeah, please go. Uh, there are a few comments I want to make. Yeah. One is that, uh, see, the CT scan is mandatory because you have to see the pneumatization of the clinoid and how much of the clinoid is pneumatized that has already been told. Then the Fiesta or the CIS image is required to see the optic nerve and the other nerves around, which also have been told. The CT angiography, CT angiography, you try to see the CT angiography in the attenuation of the vessels as well as the tumor. So you will be able to see that how much is the encasement of the vessels. If the wall of the vessel is involved in that condition, you will see the irregular wall and maybe some concretions of the tumor has entered the wall also. Then... Uh, Say the intracanalicular portion of the tumor, if you see the MRI, maybe even the plain images, if you see it critically with the neuroradiologist, you should be able to find out a small lesion there. Even if you don't find, the removal, uh, say opening of the canal is very important because you may miss a tumor on the MRI and the patient's vision may not improve. So that removal of the tumor from there is mandatory. The tumor consistency, it has been told. On MRI, if you do a T2 image, if it is a hypo-intense tumor, most of the time it will be fibrous and it will be tough. There is something which has newly come up. It's not much in practice. 
that is magnetoelastography by which you can see the consistency of the tumor then uh, the the dissection of the vessel it should be from the distal to the proximal because most of the time the proximal vessels are involved not the distal as you have already told we should start from the middle cerebral side so we will be going from the clearer plane to the involved plane okay. so that will be a better thing. and you have already told this thing that uh, you do the extra dural thing what you do is that when you are removing the terminal portion of the clinoid extra durally and then the uh, what you do is you remove whatever you can with not much of the retraction extra durally the yes. remaining terminal portion as you have already shown is to be removed intra dural to sure. avoid the less retraction absolutely last is one uh, there are two questions i want to put up sure. one is that the, why these patients had the papilledema usually they should have optic atrophy only and the other is do you give intra operative methyl prednisolone any questions any other questions uh, these these are the two questions right first to about your comments your comments go uh, you know hand in hand with what to all what i said uh, the mm. fiesta the city and geography uh, that sometimes one can see the involvement of the vessels i know about all these things but my 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 message is this even if you see that there is some involvement in the world the only time that you can be sure that this tumor cannot be excised is intraoperatively and not preoperative so these are things that would help us maybe in the consent form maybe to tell the patient some words but the actual thing is what you see in the urine cell now you mentioned about the papilledema and optic atrophy um, the, you can have both you can have optic papilledema followed by optic atrophy so what to speak about many stages of uh, optic nerve optic chiasm and uh, affection with a vast by papilledema or by secondary optic atrophy intraoperative methylprednisolone i've never used it in cases of the this uh, thing in fact the you know methylprednisolone has been used in the spinal injuries and so on and so forth and i think that's been stopped now recently uh, i've never believed in its efficacy in the intracranial lesions that is something that people would do just to satisfy themselves for me it's not on yes professor horge salazar would you like to come in, sir hello yeah, yeah please congratulations on your great lecture i would like to ask what measures do you advise to use to avoid bleeding on the region of cavernous sinus right so you are asking about if i have face a bleeding from the cavernous sinus and to avoid what i do Is that yes. your question? Yeah. Uh, I think it was back in 2006 or five. Uh, there were a few papers, especially one from Ali Krishna and the others, about the use of a T cell that you inject into the different spaces in the cavernous sinus. That still holds true. You can use surgical cell, you can use T cell, etc., etc. And there is a trick for that. that you also pressurize the lateral wall of the cavernous sinus so that it will not flow back into the major blood vessels so the use of t cell or the dural sealant and the surge cell or gel foam for where the when the bleeding is coming from the cavernous sinus it usually uh, works very nice yeah, i have a question yeah please But as you have sir that preoperatively we cannot determine whether we can resect the tumor to its entirety it can be dissected decided only intraoperatively yes so intra intraoperatively we have seen in many of our cases the internal carotid anterior cerebral complex even the proximal part of the middle cerebral are completely encased by the tumor yes. so what factors you take bring in your mind to leave a small amount of tumor on the arterial wall or dissect it completely from the arterial wall because we have seen many of our cases when we have dissected it completely free from the arterial wall there was post operative spasm even if it, we have completely removed the tumor from the optic nerve the yeah. patient did not recover completely from the blindness sure so is there any deciding factor that leaving a small amount of you are over the optic nerve or, uh, or carotid artery or denuding it completely even if it getting denuded good sure. plane good plane of defense sir sure. still absolutely you will leave. absolutely right 
So, as I said, you have to go in to the mental state that I am going to remove every piece of the tumor. And you only decide when to stop intraoperative. But if I find that the tumor is actually going into the wall of the blood vessel, I have no hesitation in stopping at that particular stage. As I said, I don't want to be courageous on the expense of the patient. I do not want to produce good post-operative films on the expense of the patient. I want both. I want good clinical outcome and I want good post-operative MRI. This is my aim. So I have no hesitation in raising the flag, the white flag and surrender. I say I cannot produce any further results. I stop immediately. So as I said, it is something that you just try to find when to stop and the tumor is really going into the wall. And I see this quite often in the craniopharyngiomas, where the calcification is actually going into the wall. It is stuck. And if you pull, and I, I did that early in my career, I pulled this piece of calcification and the carotid open on me. So one has really to, to, uh, to uh, get a good result for the patient. Thank you, Professor Ibrahim. And uh, we have many uh, good things uh, from you. And uh, you. Uh, we, can, uh, we can do the uh, best surgery and uh, selection uh, preoperatively and interoperatively uh, yes. from your lecture. And uh, I would like to uh, cross this section. And uh, thank you again, uh, Professor Ibrahim. Thank you. Thank you all, and um, you. really, it's my pleasure and uh, honor to uh, be part of the ACNS and uh, to be right. part of this very nice group of people. Uh, so, hello to everybody, and I uh, hope you good evening, good afternoon, whatever. Thank so, you very much. So, if there are no more questions, then we will wind up this session. On behalf of the Education Committee and the President of CEO Kokato, I would like to thank the Speaker Professor Ibrahim Sabe and the Chair Professor Rikawa, who came here and educated us regarding the technical nuances of spinocavernous meningioma. Thank you, Lou, for coming and all the attendees who came here and shared the knowledge with the young neurosurgeons and residents. Thank you, everybody. So until next uh, Wednesday, it is all bye-bye from all of us. Thank you, everybody, for joining. <laughs>